good day wherever this event finds you. I'm Scott Eisner, president of the U.S. Africa Business Center here at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. We're pleased to welcome you to the 2021 Africa Digital Economy Summit, the fourth in a series of annual events the Chamber has hosted to shine a spotlight on innovation, ingenuity, and the impact of the digital economy across Africa. Given the emerging issues impacting digital transformation across the continent, the exciting promise of the African continental free trade area, we have reimagined the summit from a single market focus last year on Nigeria to a pan-African conversation. Similarly, building off the success of the 2020 Nigeria Digital Economy Forum I just mentioned and our collaboration with ABC Nigeria, our AmCham affiliate in Nigeria and member companies, later you'll hear about a startup competition that we'll be incorporating into our body of work in 2022. At today's forum, we are joined by African leaders, government officials, business executives, and policy experts from the U.S. and across the continent. They are truly passionate about the commercial partnerships between Africa and the United States in the digital economy. All of you are certainly our special guests, and we're honored to have you by your, by your participation today. And at last count, we had over 750 people tuning in from around the world. And at the risk of potentially missing someone, I would like to take this moment to acknowledge that all protocols are being observed. I'd like to give a special thanks to the board of directors of the U.S. Africa Business Center, whose guidance and commitment to our work inspire us. I'd like to take a moment to thank you, to thank our summit sponsors uh, who have been dedicated partners in making today's forum a meaningful discussion. Our top sponsor, Google, our digital driver, Flutterwave, our digital innovator, Vistabank, our digital champion, and Citibank, our digital architect. Thank you all for your support of today's event and our ongoing work at the AUS Africa Business Center. I'd also like to thank our network of over 30 American Chambers of Commerce in Africa for helping to make today's speech or today's event such a resounding success. We truly appreciate your collaboration. A little about the Chamber for those who are new to our platform. The US Chamber is the world's largest business organization. Our members range from small businesses and Chambers of Commerce across the country that support their communities to leading industry associations and global corporations that innovate and solve for the world's challenges to emerging fast growing industries that are shaping our future. For all of the people, for all of the people across the businesses we represent, the US Chamber is a trusted advocate, a partner and a network helping to improve society and people's lives. The US Africa Business Center located within the chamber is the hub for these members to engage stakeholders in cities and capitals across the United States and Africa. We have been leading our members in this respect for over a decade. As we convene the 2021 Digital Economy Summit, the world has just marked an unfortunate two-year anniversary in which the global or COVID-19 global pandemic has been part of our lives. Today's summit will address how two years have changed our thinking about the importance of the digital world that will help to lead to innovation and collaboration that can help unleash the sector's impact on the continent and certainly its impact on the world. The ongoing pandemic has demonstrated that the digital innovation can offer new ways to address the biggest and most enduring challenges. Countries equipped with infrastructure, extensive networks that enable connectivity and advanced digital platforms have been critical to help companies innovate in serving their customers, schools to deliver education remotely and governments to respond to and withstand the market shocks triggered by COVID-19. Alongside our members, the US Africa Business Center believes the ongoing digital transformation on the continent is laying the foundation for inclusive recovery, economic opportunity, and creating jobs. Our partners can count on the US Africa Business Center and our members to support aspirate Africa's aspirations and initiative to accelerate the transformation be it to the AFCFTA, the African Continental Free Trade Area, which inaugurated trading this year, or through a celebration of new pathways to spur trade and investment and utilizing the U.S. framework of AGOA, the African Growth Opportunity Act. This year alone, we've had scores of events focus on different aspects of how Africa and the U.S. can co-create in the digital space. In the last few months alone, we've hosted a private sector, a for, a private sector AGOA forum in October to examine new pathways to trade created by e-commerce and the creative industries. Last week, we hosted an event at the chamber where we welcome in partners from across Washington to celebrate the opportunities that the digital economy represents. This amazing turnout of uh, thought leaders and collaborators was capped off, capped off by a speech 
by Dana Banks, Senior Director for Africa at the NSC, the, Na the National Security Committee, and Special Advisor to President Biden. She noted that the digital economy is going to be one of the driving pillars of US-Africa policy for decades to come. And next week, we're convening a dialogue at the chamber with the Secretary General of the African Continental Free Trade Area to learn how business community in the United States can support the African trade bloc and be partners for the next phase of its implementation in the new year. It's now my distinct honor and pleasure of introducing the chamber's executive vice president and head of international affairs, Myron Brilliant. Myron has been at the leading forefront, as leading the has been at the forefront of leading the chamber's work around the world for over two decades. He is one of the most thoughtful people when it comes to trade and investment, and has a true passion for Africa. Myron, the floor is yours. Thank you, Scott, for that uh, kind introduction. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening to all of our friends who are joining us for the U.S. Africa Business Center's 2021 Africa Digital Economy Summit. And I am really excited about the attendance this year. It surpasses last year's very successful forum. I think we all know that the U.S. Chamber's members have really put the digital economy at the top of their list when it comes to area of growth. Let me say inclusive growth and opportunity. This week alone, we're hosting digital forums with the European Union and India. And I think that what that says is we're underscoring the global importance of this topic and how it will shape our collective futures. Today's summit showcases the vital work of the U.S. Africa Business Center under Scott Eisner's leadership and his whole team. And thankfully, all the corporate members who are active with us have really been encouraging a drive towards greater economic integration between the United States and Africa. And if you're not already involved, get involved with the U.S. Africa Business Center. But let me say that the benefits of the digital economy go beyond the traditional focus on technology. It's really a whole of the economy issue. It touches on manufacturing and agriculture, services, sustainable solutions, education, and health. This has been a really a common thread in my conversations and those of my colleagues with various world leaders in 2021. I'm reminded of my conversation with President Kenyatta during the Chamber's Spring Global Forum on Economic Recovery, how much he touched on this issue, how critical it was for Kenya and for East Africa as it is for the rest of Africa. In every case, leaders have been underscoring and reiterating how the digital economy has aided the way that nations have weathered the pandemic, created new avenues for economic growth, and ensured that their citizens have real-time information to keep their loved ones healthy. So it has many different tenets uh, throughout society. I want to say to everyone, the commercial aspects are important. Every aspect of life, however, is important. The digital economy is an important, I think, innovator, not just a disruptor. Innovation and a strong ICT market are critical components in our collective view of a global competitive economy and a sign of a country's attractiveness to investors. And that's what we're here in part to talk about, the U.S. commitment to making investments across Africa. During the COVID pandemic, we have witnessed the accelerated speed, certainly, of the digital transformation and have a greater appreciation for the power of the digital economy as a driver of growth and innovation, we do not want to see people left behind. Globally, we know the digital economy has ex is expected to be worth something like $23 trillion by 2025, representing nearly one-fourth of the world's GDP. In Africa, the contribution of the digital sector to the continent's economy, growing economy, is estimated to be up to $700 plus billion by 2050, but we can accelerate that if the right policies are put in place. So let's talk about not only growth projections, but how we see some challenges that have to be addressed. These growth projections that I've discussed are just going to become a reality and the innovation that's going to be unleashed because of the technical uh, dynam dynamic economies in Africa can only really be realized if we avoid roadblocks to success. What are some of the roadblocks? The high cost of connectivity and lack of infrastructure. The educational foundation to support digital literacy and skills development, an area that the U.S. Chamber really focuses on, not just in the context of Africa, but also in the United States. And third, 
We have to enable an ecosystem of regulations that support safe and secure data flows, sound investment, the right tax policies and postal policies as well. And of course, a predictable, transparent rule of law environment for investors. But we want to be partners with governments in putting those principles to work. Let's highlight just briefly at the beginning of this summit, very important summit, the work that the U.S. Chamber is doing in partnering with many to address many of these challenges I just outlined, and frankly, turning it into an opportunity, not just a challenge. Throughout the work of the U.S. Africa Business Center, we have been really committed to building lasting prosperity for Africans and Americans through job creation and entrepreneurial spirit. It's both job creation and entrepreneurial spirit that we are here today at this summit. In the United States and Africa, and let's be honest, globally, we see the development of strong policies that can drive economic growth and inclusive recovery. But it can't happen without the role of the private sector. Certainly, in our view, the United States government also has to play a role, which is why we are so proud to please and pleased to support the 2022 U.S. Africa's Leaders Summit that President Biden recently announced. Frankly, it's about time. We've been pushing for U.S. leadership from the administration and previous administrations because we see the excitement and dynamism and the potential in Africa. So we're very excited to be a part of, frankly, a key pillar of the recommendations that have been made to the president and the administration when he took office earlier this year to come to fruition with the announcement of this summit. Truth be told, we can't, the private sector cannot do it alone. We need to work hand in hand with our government and with the governments across Africa. And we're committed to doing that with President Biden and his team, as we are with the governments that are represented on this call today and in this summit. A strong business component, component to the Leader Summit next year will transform not a just a symbolic announcement, but certainly turn, take that announcement as something more tangible with commercial results for both Africa and the United States. Mind you, there are important things coming up that we're all taking a look out for. AGOA is set to expire, for example, in 2025. The Chamber remains committed to fostering a new kind of trade partnership with Africa, one that helps expand mutually beneficial two-way trade between the United States and Africa. And beyond ago, we have to think creatively about how to do that. We've been proponents, for example, of bilateral FTAs and continuing to be proponents, for example, the one that the Chamber has championed and was really a driver with Kenya. We'd like to see that completed. But we also think there are regional opportunities that we need to explore. We are fully aware of the importance, for example, of the African continental free trade area. We want to see that fully implemented and we've been supportive, but we want to see the United States play a role in that kind of strategic, coherent, economic, integrated system. We think we can go further. In the United States, we, look at, we need to look at how we are using our development dollars and capacity building efforts to help our companies engage across effect, uh, effectively and meaningfully Africa. We know that our competitors, whether they're from Asia or Europe or elsewhere, are also taking steps to improve their own positioning in Africa. We don't want to be left behind. We cannot afford to sit on the sidelines and let this happen. We need to look at ways that the United States bring creativity and innovation to our public policy agenda in Africa, as well as our commercial interests. And we're going to do that. We are looking now at specific ways to help our government take active measures to advance the role, for example, how U.S. foreign commercial service officers uh, play not only around the globe, but in Africa. Let's enhance their role and their ability to help U.S. companies operate on the ground and their ability to work not only with U.S. companies, but with the governments in the places that they operate. So we're going to drive policy reforms in the U.S. and across Africa. We're going to encourage greater opportunities for America's growing youth population. And let me add, for women. Very important to have women and the youth a part of this digital revolution. And we want us all to work on this together. In closing, again, let me congratulate Scott Eisner and the entire team at the US Africa Business Center and all of our members for this dynamic program. It couldn't be possible without our members. 
But I also want to thank the honorable heads of state, the U.S. government officials, and many executives who are going to be participating actively in today's dialogue. Rest assured, our desire to expand our efforts to translate this summit into action is real, it's meaningful, and it's impactful. Scott, back to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Myron, for your leadership and your thoughtful remarks. We are committed to really deepening uh, what we do on the continent, but also pushing the U.S. government to be bold in their thinking about how we devise policy that engages the continent and is a win-win solution on both sides uh, of the waters, if you will. And now, it's my distinct honor to introduce someone who I had the opportunity to meet earlier this year, the president of <coughs> sorry, Zambia, uh, President Inchilema. We were fortunate to meet during uh, the UNGA meetings earlier this year. I was taken by his vision for incorporating the youth via a digital world into his plans. He's a business person who is committed to bettering the lives of all that he serves. He's an amazing leader and one that we're excited to see grow in his portfolio. Mr. President, the floor is yours. Distinguished invited guests, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to join Africa and the rest of the world at this important event, the 2021 Africa Digital Economy Summit, whose focus is to discuss the emerging issues driving technological change and impacting transformation on the African continent. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to start by commending the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for inviting Zambia to share her digital transformation. I must acknowledge from the outset that Zambia is cognizant of the fact that digital transformation offers numerous opportunities for African economies to fully participate in global value chains and penetrate into the international markets, even especially amidst the current COVID-19 global pandemic. According to the United Nations, reaching the goal of universal and affordable internet coverage can raise growth per capita by two percentage points per year and reduce the poverty headcount by one percentage point per year. It is our desire to realize the economic gains resulting from the digital transformation, which include one, increased innovations, two, reduction in transaction costs, three, enhanced business competitiveness, four, job creation, five, rural information inclusivity, six, overall increased public and private sector information management efficiency, productivity, and indeed accountability. Ladies and gentlemen, in Zambia, digital transformation is already facilitating economic activities, mainly through enhanced financial services, e-commerce, streamlined and electronically accessible government services, and information dissemination for agricultural productivity, to mention just a few. In this regard, the Zambian government considers digital transformation critical for enhancing economic efficiency and productivity. Increasingly, it is creating employment opportunities for the youth in various sectors such as transport, logistics, trade, financial services, the creative industry included. In recognition of this, our government has created a dedicated ministry for technology and science to champion the digital transformation agenda and support private sector innovations. I am pleased to share this ministry is already making strides and recently concluded an MOU, Memorandum of Understanding, with APSA Bank Zambia and United Nations Industrial Development Organization, UNIDO, to support the development of technology innovation hubs across the country. In addition, our ICT regulator, the Zambia Information and Communications Technology Authority, ZICTA, won the African Telecommunications Union, ATU, and the International Telecommunications Union, ITU, award for their ICT innovation program. Ladies and gentlemen, to complement private sector innovations, our government is working on reduced regulatory costs through increased provision of government electronic services. We will bolster efforts to facilitate access to e-government services, financial management systems, business registration, immigration, road transport registration, tax and customs, judicial processes, social sector user fees, and electronic health management, among others. 
In recognition of our unique geographical position as a land-linked country with eight neighbors serving as the main connecting hub for the eastern and southern Africa and the Great Lakes Transport Corridor, enhancing digital trade facilitation continues to be our priority. This includes continued efforts to improve electronically simplified movement of goods across our multiple borders. Further, in line with our multilateral commitments under the World Trade Organization, WTO, trade facilitation agreement, we will continue investments in improving and increasing border infrastructure. Very important. We will additionally invest in the harmonization of multi-government agents clearing procedures through digital solutions. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, our government remains committed to strengthening the conducive policy environment to maximize gains from digital transformation. In this respect, we are currently drafting the national e-governance strategy and reforming ICT legislation to support the growth of digital entrepreneurs, promote the development of digital skills, and facilitate the creation and efficient and transparent digital marketplace. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for facilitating this dialogue and providing us the opportunity to share experiences and insights, of course, on how Africa can continue to develop its digital economy. Thank you, and God bless you all. Well, thank you so much, Mr. President. You hit on so many important points there. The transparency that the digital economy brings to government that reassures your citizens, the value added to supply chain, something that I think everyone in the world now is feeling a little bit of a pinch on, especially as the holidays come around and you're wondering whether or not your gifts for your loved ones will get off their ships in time, but also the enabling environment and the fact that it does really level the playing field for all sectors of society. So thank you very much for your very thoughtful remarks. As a perfect segue, I'm now honored to introduce you uh, to introduce U.S. Africa Business Center board member and representative of our platinum sponsor today, Google. Nitin uh, Gargia uh, has been motivating has been a motivating force behind the chamber's engagement in Africa for many years now. Google is our leader and serves as chair of our digital economy task force, and Nitin has truly been a partner as we thought about how do we develop an inclusive environment for our work in the digital space. Nitin. Thank you, Scott. Hi, my name is Nitin Gajria, and I'm the Managing Director for Google in Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm thrilled to be here today and thank you so much for having me. I've been on the continent now for a little over two years with my family. And as I think about technology and Africa, the thing that I, I think is one of the most profound questions for us is there's 300 million people on the continent that are on the internet today. There's 800 million people that have never experienced the internet yet. We know that they will come online soon. The question for us is, what kind of internet will they, will they experience? What will they do with that internet? How will they leverage that access to the world's information to solve problems, to make economic progress? And that's what really, really excites me about technology and its impact on the continent. Now, a couple of months ago, back in October, we made an announcement to invest a billion dollars in Africa over the next five years. These investments are designed to support the continent's digital transformation in four key areas. First, enabling affordable access and building products for every kind of African user. Second, helping businesses with their digital transformation. Third, investing in entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship to spur next generation technology. And fourth, to support nonprofits that are working to improve lives in Africa. Now, of course, we won't be successful at any of this without partnerships with African governments, policymakers, educators, entrepreneurs, and businesses all across Africa. 
So as we embark on this journey over the next five years, we want to build on our previous efforts to help every African business, classroom, government, and individuals. And for this to happen, connectivity is incredibly important. Now, research tells us that with every 10% increase in internet penetration, GDP increases by 1.4%. And in the five years, and in the next five years, we expect 300 million Africans to come online for the very first time. Now, we are invested in building out infrastructure to help everyone get online. Now, this includes Equiano, which is a subsea cable that will connect Africa to Europe. This subsea cable is a state-of-the-art uh, cable that, that, that will provide 20 times more network capacity than the last cable built to serve the region. We're already making a huge amount of progress in the construction of this cable with landing points in Nigeria, Namibia, St. Helena, as well as South Africa. We're expecting this cable to lead to a 21% drop in internet prices uh, across, across the areas that this cable lands in. We're also expecting a five-fold increase in internet speeds in Nigeria and a three-fold increase in South Africa. Between 2022, and 2025, Equiano should indirectly create 1.7 million jobs in Nigeria and South Africa, driven by the expansion of the digital e economy as well as growth in peripheral sectors. Now, beyond infrastructure to bring people online, one of the big challenges that we're also looking at is how do we get more devices into more hands? Over the course of the last year, we've been working with Safaricom, a, a, a telco in uh, Kenya, to pilot a new feature on the Android operating system that enables partners to sell devices on a financial plan. What this does is it dramatically reduces the upfront cost of acquiring a smartphone for the end user. We're looking forward to expand this pilot across more partners in more countries in the course of the coming months and years. Now, looking beyond driving access, we know that Africa is a small business-driven set of economies. We also know that we're in the midst of seeing a very young but growing and dynamic startup ecosystem flourish. I've been inspired by the innovation that, uh, that African developers and African uh, founders have been bringing into the tech startup scene. Now, in the last year, we've seen more investment rounds in African tech startups than ever before but there's still a tremendous amount of headroom uh, for, us to, uh, for us to explore. Now, I firmly believe that some of Africa's most profound challenges are best solved by these tech entrepreneurs, by these tech founders, and by these developers. Now, in order to enable them, we've recently announced a $50 million Africa investment fund aimed at growth stage startups on the continent. This is as a complement to some of the other efforts we have around the, te around the tech startup scene, uh, including our uh, Google for Startups uh, Africa program, um, as well as our work with developers all, all over the continent and research work we've been doing in the space. Looking beyond uh, entrepreneurs, looking beyond SMBs, we've got to look at education. Now, skills development also means investing in childhood and higher education. Now, we've developed helpful tools for remote learning to help children across Africa to improve literacy and develop necessary skills for the future. In the past 18 months, these tools have enabled 500,000 students and 25,000 teachers to keep education going even through the pandemic. We also launched uh, cloud higher education programs in eight African countries to bolster research funding for African academic researchers and faculty. Our partnership with the UNDP empowered 25,000 students and 800 teachers across 20 schools by giving them access to Google Workspace for education, training, devices, and full Wi-Fi access. This is just one example of how helpful partners can be when, it come, when we come together to solve problems. Now, in closing, I want to point out that we're still in the thick of the COVID-19 pandemic. We've seen, uh, we've seen a new variant emerge, and we know that the road to solving uh, for COVID is gonna be long. We're gonna be in this situation for a while yet. 
And this is why we've been uh, collaborating with governments all across Africa and communities to mitigate the impact of the crisis through the COVID-19 uh, SOS alerts, community mobility reports, uh, providing insights into what has changed in response to policies aimed at combating COVID-19 and com uh, combating COVID-19 related misinformation as well. We've also partnered with Apple uh, to develop an exposure notifications technology for public health authorities to do, cont to do contact tracing in South Africa. And it is in the works for Kenya and a few other countries. In Kenya, Nigeria, and South Africa, we've provided crisis relief grants to nonprofits helping underserved communities mitigate the impact of the pandemic. And we will continue to do so throughout the continent, but we can't do it without partnership from across governments, from private sector and civil society. I wanna say a big thank you to our partners and collaborators, both in government and in, and in private sector. We deeply value your support and I hope we can continue the conversation around how we can work better together to further Africa's digital transformation. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Nitin, for your leadership and your partnership. And in just a short while, you'll hear from our VP, Vice President, Kendra Gaither, and our Executive Director, Gavira Yao. But I'd like to thank the entire Chamber team that is behind the scenes uh, today's with today's production. And a special shout out to my teammates, Alessandra Walsh and Emma Shonum, for your leadership and for your guidance and for helping us all look professional as we are on these platforms. Thank you. Your uh, work is not going unnoticed. And it's now my uh, distinct pleasure to introduce you to Ambassador Vinay Thimalapale, Acting Director of the U.S. Trade Development Agency. USTDA has been a key partner for the business community, supporting our members as they look towards new markets in which to invest. USTDA has been a nimble partner at that, who many years ago recognizing, recognized the increasing importance of Africa's digital landscape. And we'll be hearing from the Ambassador all about what they're doing to help American businesses grow in and around the continent. Ambassador, floor is yours. Uh, good morning, good day. Uh, thank you, Scott, and thank you to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce for inviting me to the Africa Digital Economy Summit. USTDA is very proud uh, of our partnership with the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Together, we're advancing strategic sectors such as the digital infrastructure that will help shape Africa's economic growth for years, if not decades to come. As many of you may know, USTDA is the Overseas Project Preparation Agency of the U.S. government. Our work is specifically designed to facilitate the implementation of quality infrastructure solutions in emerging markets. For us, digital transformation in Africa is among our top priorities globally. In terms of how we fulfill our mission, we provide grant-based funding for activities such as feasibility studies, technical assistance, and pilot projects. These are all critical tools for structuring bankable infrastructure deals. The key word there is bankable. USTDA also supports partnership building events such as reverse trade missions and workshops that connect overseas project sponsors to US companies. Our model helps to ensure that our partners in Africa receive the best possible analysis and advice as well as an understanding of the innovative solutions that U.S. companies offer. This is particularly the case when it comes to digital infrastructure, where U.S. companies lead the world in terms of innovation and quality. That's why two years ago, U.S. TDA launched our Access Africa initiative. Under Access Africa, we're working in concert with both the public and private sectors across the continent to expand digital access for millions of people, especially those living in underserved communities. Access Africa is built of a core US TDA strength, connecting US companies to the partners and projects that will shape Africa's digital transformation. We currently have 16 US industry partners who share our vision of an Africa where every city, town, and village is connected to high-speed, affordable internet. 
And as you might suspect, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is one of our Access Africa partners. Through our collaboration with U.S. industry, we have built a digital infrastructure portfolio in more than 20 African countries. This portfolio directly supports exports from more than 65 U.S. companies in the U.S. These are real results. We're successful because of, of our programming is demand driven and responsive to Africa's needs. If you look at our work, what you'll notice is that, our, that we partner with US companies on some very innovative approaches towards expanding connectivity and bridging Africa's digital divide. For example, USTDA is funding a feasibility study to help the South African internet provider, Jenny Internet, to expand affordable internet access, uh, affordable internet access across rural Southern Africa. Our study will demonstrate how US wireless technologies can lower the cost of international data transmission and expand Jenny Internet's last mile connectivity infrastructure in five countries. These countries are Botswana, the Democratic, Democratic Republic of the Congo, DRC, Swatini, Mozambique and South Africa. Much of USCDA's focus on digital transformation falls into the category of smart cities, where we are partnering with Africa's municipalities to advance clean energy, healthcare infrastructure, and transportation solutions that will be vital for Africa's long-term economic growth. For example, we have helped the city of Cape Town in South Africa access the viability of digital inclusion investments for their townships. We have also helped them plan the development or rather deployment of intelligent transportation systems and water resource management solutions that are improving public safety, security, and quality of life overall. USTDA's smart city projects are helping Africa to strengthen its resilience in the face of external challenges such as the current pandemic, COVID-19, and the impacts of climate change. Deploying U.S. digital solutions is a top priority for the Biden-Harris administration. Under the Build Back Better World initiative, also known as B3W, the president has asked agencies, including USTDA, to work together and with our G7 partners to catalyze hundreds of billions of dollars of infrastructure investment for low- and middle-income countries in the coming years. Digital technology is one of the key areas of focus, as is climate, health and health security, and gender equity and equality. Our goal is to increase access to inclusive, secure, and sustainable connectivity for all Africans. At USTDA, we're bridging Africa's div digital divide with like-minded partners like the Chamber of Commerce who are committed to deploying high quality US infrastructure solutions across the continent. And we are generating results, results for Africa that will be good for business and economic growth and results for the United States through exports and US jobs. Our goal is nothing less than helping Africa fully realize its vision for a connected continent. We really look forward to working with you in pursuit of this shared vision. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ambassador Thimalapali. That was a great outline of what our partnership can do together. And I'm really struck by the fact that you noted that for a U.S. Trade and Development Agency that a top priority globally is Africa's digital transformation. It really speaks to the conversation we're having today and the issues that we're hoping to dive into on this really exciting panel, which is focused on enabling growth through Africa's digital finance ecosystem. 
And I use the term ecosystem because as you can have heard uh, throughout the conversations today, you've heard a focus on infrastructure. You heard the president of Zambia talk about uh, ICT reforms and e-governance. You heard the talk about uh, connecting small and medium enterprise uh, uh, enterprises to the internet. And you heard Google talk about the 800 million African citizens who have not yet uh, connected to the internet. So it's quite a, a, a panoply of issues um, that uh, affect the ability of the African digital economy landscape to, to be transformative. Um, and one of the most exciting components of that transformation of that growth has actually been the fintech sector. And in fact, over the last decade, Africa's uh, fintech space has experienced phenomenal growth um, and it's contributed to the advancement of e-commerce uh, on the continent. Um, and there have been a number of multi, a multitude actually of innovative approaches to fintech. And we'll get a chance to talk about what that digital finance, that digital payments ecosystem looks like, um, noting that um, at present, Africa is the second largest uh, banking market in the world today in terms of growth, profitability, um, and part of that is built on the fact that there's been a rapid adoption of technology and really the innovations that uh, we're all learning from globally uh, in the space of mobile money. Um, so to help uh, us get a bit smarter about those topics and to, to really delve into that enabling uh, ecosystem. I'm pleased to be joined today uh, by two outstanding leaders in the practice. Um, first is Lucy Nshuti Mbabazi, who is the head of Africa Advocacy and Partnerships for the Better Than Cash Alliance. And we're also joined by Princess Kele Nzie, who is the Regional Expansions Lead for Flutter Wave, a fintech that's been garnering quite a, a bit of attention. So let's get right into the conversation. I'd like to start with an opening question to sort of get us uh, excited about the dialogue. Um, and uh, as I know that you ladies are aware, according to, to Digest Africa, uh, in just this uh, third quarter that recently closed, um, African fintech companies raised nearly a billion dollars in revenue. Um, and that really reflected about 60% of all the venture capital that's flowing to the continent. Um, can you tell us, and we'll start with you first, Lucy, and then and then Princess, um, what do you believe are the factors that are driving investment uh, in these digital finance platforms? And how do you see this enthusiasm in, in fintech uh, translating into other uh, aspects of the ecosystem, other sectors? Lucy. Thank you, and thank you for the kind invitation to this great discussion. I think the single driving factor is opportunity, right? Uh, the continent uh, has 1.23 uh, uh, billion people. And every day we are transacting where, you know, someone is buying and selling. We have vibrant markets. At least they were really vibrant before the pandemic. And so all these markets, filled with people buying and selling every day, conducting all that business manually spells opportunity. Uh, and you know, whether it is the, uh, the uh, payments or it is the managing stock, it is the logistics of it all, all of that spells opportunity, which makes uh, uh, the FinTech uh, um, uh, you know, innovation really exciting and a great investment. So if you look at, uh, uh, I think the, the recent, the report that I saw in, in 2019, where um, over, I think 60, about 70% of Africa's GDP is consumer expenditure. And over 90% of that was being transacted in cash. Enter the fintechs. If we, you know, without the innovation of fintechs, uh, 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 banks that are also, you know, quickly becoming fintechs, uh, uh, we cannot digitize quickly. So I think all, all these investments are seeing the opportunity of digitizing, you know, even if you get 5% of that activity, 10%, the impact is, incre is incredible, both on your investment, but also especially 
in the lives of people. So the biggest driver is opportunity. There is no question about it. I, you know, uh, uh, I walk around, at least I've been doing this work for the last 10 years, driving digitization of payments. And it is the opportunity that I saw in a refugee camp that painted a picture of all that is possible when uh, digitization happened. The great thing about fintechs, they move quickly, they're agile, uh, 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 but they're also burdened by having to work with so many players because interoperability is still very much a luxury. Uh, and uh, policymakers are, you know, uh, are work, and these are things that we're pushing and, uh, at the Alliance where we, among the UN principles for responsible digitization of payments, we say interoperability uh, drives choice for consumers and therefore it's important that the ecosystem uh, has interoperable payments which could then make life so much easier for, uh, for fintechs. So the opportunity is exciting. The challenges are opportunities. And I, you know, <laughs> for, for those who are looking to invest, I can't imagine that uh, those monies will not have a return on investment. And this is why you see, uh, you know, companies like Flutterwave and others commanding uh, uh, big, uh, big, inve big investments as they come into the market to scale uh, what they've already tested that is exciting. Well, thank you for that. I love that you said challenges are opportunities, and we're going to come to the challenges in a second. But first, let's stick with opportunities and let's hear from Princess. Thank you very much for um, having us here as well. Um, to answer the question, I believe that digital platforms have become the preferred and dominant business models for a lot of banks and financial institutions because this offers consumers and a lot of small businesses the ability to connect to financial and other service providers, either through an online or a mobile channel. And this becomes an integrated part of their day-to-day -day activities. Um, this would also um, spark an increase in the investment channel to digital finance platforms today. Um, a few factors also driving this shift would be that a lot of financial institutions are transitioning from product orientation to a customer orientation and with the focus on delivering differentiated customer experience to target markets. Um, Imagine markets in Africa, in um, South America, in the South Pacific are also next greenfield for unicorns and successful companies. So we believe that this would also drive um, a high rate of investment within um, digital finance platforms. It's also important to note that there's been an increase in the access to digital and the rise in financial inclusion. So we have a lot of population aging and changes happening. Um, a lot more people are constantly on their on their devices they are on digital either on the social media platforms messaging platforms so it becomes highly important for financial institutions to position themselves where customers are and create um, a corresponding digital platform strategy relevant to those markets where they are positioned um, as well as a customer service proposition and strategic objectives um, we also know that um, fintech activity and financial institutions are backed by a range of demand and supply. So evidence today um, stipulates that where financial in, um, inclusion supports um, financial adoption, then we have jurisdictions where we have economic growth scaling, especially in our emerging markets and developing economies. So I think these are some of the reasons why we've had a high rise of increase in investments in digital finance platforms. Thank you for that. Um, I, I love that you also highlighted the demographic aspect of this too, because I do think that's a key driver of, of sparking both demand as, as more youthful um, consumers get online, but also the opportunities um, that, that we've been discussing throughout. Um, so looking at that other side, taking uh, Lucy's statement that challenges are opportunities, we'd note that in our, our chat, there were a number of questions that came up that actually connect very well with uh, the, the, the concept of potential roadblocks. Um, so we've seen the excitement, the great opportunity that, that FinTech provides, not just for the sector, but um, that backing end is supply and demand, the, the various ways in which um, this is really a connector sector 
Um, but if you if you wouldn't mind, and I'll, I'll start with you first this time, Princess, um, given all of the, the driving for growth uh, that's happening um, and the focus on scaling, we know that can be a complex proposition. Um, can you share with us maybe some of the potential roadblocks that could um, stymie the, the great potential of this sector to be transformative? Um, what are some of the things that uh, perhaps you all are spending your, your time focused on trying to address to ensure that uh, the sector can still continue to grow? Okay, thank you for that question. Um, I believe one of the major or potential roadblocks would be the unpredictable nature of regulations, um, which means that regulatory requirements are rapidly changing and fintechs as well as financial institutions will constantly need to standardize our compliance and onboarding processes so that we remain compliant with regulations. Um, another potential roadblock that I see is um, the increased trust in cash, um, despite technology permitting through a lot of our financial transactions and processes, we still have a lot of economies that are still predominantly cash-based. Um, so a vast majority of customers prefer to use fiscal cash as opposed to tech-driven alternatives, which might actually be easier to use. So um, to fast track our growth and increase the transformational impact of the fintech sector, we believe it'll, um, these two roadblocks are um, you know, important to note, and they pose, um, pose a huge obstacle. Thank you, and I particularly appreciate you uh, focusing in on some of the regulatory challenges. That's something that we spend a lot of our time on generally in the digital economy space. Lucy, what are some of the roadblocks that you see or, or potential hurdles uh, to that might impact growth? Um, I, I, I like to see them as um, as opportunities for fintechs, for instance, and you know and this is why we've 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 developed these UN principles for responsible digitalization. The reason why uh, people are still preferring cash is that the alternative uh, uh, the digital channels are still either they don't know them or they are scared of them or they don't trust. You know, fundamentally, they don't trust them. So we, we uh, uh, in addition to access being a challenge, right? Because we don't need uh, internet or smart devices in order to digitally. Mobile money has shown that USSD, which can run on 2G, 3G, uh, is enough to be able to do a, 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 a transaction. So fundamentally, we need to ensure that people have the literacy to be able to conduct these uh, uh, to fully utilize the innovations that are, uh, are coming out, especially for those deeply felt needs uh, that we meet. What my experience has been is that fintechs have generally gone, you know, uh, innovated, come up with a fantastic idea, uh, and are later filling in the gaps as far as what user needs they are uh, they are uh, 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 responding to, or feeling that this surely should get people to move from digital, uh, sorry, from cash to digital. But fundamentally, when you go closer to the people, you see that, in fact, this innovation is not meeting their deeply felt need. Uh, so it's important that innovations are starting uh, by putting the user at the center. What uh, are their needs? Um, the things that I'm uh, uh, innovating, are they in a language that people are going to understand? Um, uh, is it easily accessible? Cost, cost is another uh, uh, big barrier. Because there is no interoperability, um, the cost of getting an account, uh, the cost of getting the services that you need is really high because of these small monopolies and so many players. If I think from a business perspective, a business, an average business in Africa has uh, several points of sale because you know, it's, it's bank one uh, that has given me a post. Bank two has also brought a post. Bank three, and yet they're all accepting Visa or MasterCards or the local uh, uh, switch card. And then they also have Airtel money, Orange money, MTN money. We, you know, it's too much for the business to spread their already thin capital into several institutions. So interoperability, I, I believe, is the number one driver of cost. If we can be able to uh, 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 um, 
uh, have interoperable payment systems, I believe that innovations would be easier, consumers will have greater choice. Then the providers are competing strictly on quality of service and cost. So uh, um, uh, uh, the challenge uh, of, of, of cost is, is, is everything, but it is, uh, 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 it, um, it is, uh, uh, it is countered by interoperability. Um, I think if fintechs and uh, f generally financial service providers can be able to do payments responsibly, ensure that uh, users are treated fairly, that everything is transparent. Another thing that consumers are, are aware of, including uh, businesses, is that there are hidden costs. or so there's so much in the fine print that they don't understand. If you enter any bank, there are a lot of you know frustrated people that are coming. Or if you get a if you look at the help desk calls, there are a lot of complaints around how do I change my PIN? All these things are just cumbersome for the user. So the more we design for the user, the more we uh, we 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 respond to their deeply felt needs uh, and help them understand and have the trust. I believe uh, uh, these challenges uh, would go away. So. While regulation is uh, is a barrier, I think that uh, uh, for the most part, regulators are responding to what the people are saying. Uh, you know, innovation is moving faster than regulation, and they are trying to keep up. But what is constant is the needs of people and the need to protect them. Um, and I think once we have that foundation of responsible digitization. I think regulators would be putting out, you know, new compliance rules that are less safe. And also people would be trusting fintech solutions uh, uh, a lot more to then really come into the financial sector. So I'll, uh, 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 in terms of um, uh, the, 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 the fintechs, I would say, please start with what people need. Uh, for the regulators, it's all, they're all responding to what people need. Um, and we really have to drive interoperability such that the barriers to entry for consumers, for fintechs, for businesses are greatly reduced uh, with the user choice that, that comes with it. And for the businesses uh, that use financial uh, solutions, they don't have to spread their capital so thin. They could have it into one or two institutions and make it work for them. So I look forward to seeing how that plays out, but I really believe that once we do things responsibly, uh, uh, these challenges will turn into incredible opportunities. Thank you. And thank you for, for reminding us to keep people at the center of innovation. I think that's a, a really important takeaway of, of what you described um, and, and the issue of interoperability that impacts uh, the FinTech sector is, is an issue that we look at broadly across digital economy. Um, but if I might just stay with you, Lucy, I realize that we've been talking quite a bit about your work, but we haven't talked about the Better Than Cash Alliance, which is a very unique vantage point that gives you that, that focus on the people first. Um, could I ask you, because the Better Than Cash Alliance is such a unique player um, in this effort to reduce poverty um, by supporting that, that transition from, from trusted cash to, to digital money um, and unlocking opportunities for citizens as well as small business. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how a multi-stakeholder effort like this one um, can help increase uh, the digital literacy and accelerate the adoption of cashless solutions um, that enable more inclusive growth? It sounds like that might be where you spend a lot of a lot of your focus uh, based on your previous question. So we'd welcome uh, hearing from you um, how other efforts like this can be effective. Um, you know, I, I always tell my colleagues that I hope that we can work ourselves out of a uh, in the next five years, just because uh, uh, really what we are aiming to do is to that Africa uh, or any other uh, part of the world uh, can trust you know, can sign up for something, know exactly what they are signing up for, and that it delivers on what it has promised, right? So 
what we aim to do, which our members have committed to do, and that includes uh, 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 33 governments, 13 of whom are in Africa, uh, and include uh, corporates such as GAP, Unilever, uh, and others who are making the commitment to digitize their wages, to digitize their value chains. Um, uh, uh, the World Cocoa Foundation, working to digitize uh, the cocoa value chains as well in order to, re to reduce the cash loss. Um, so our work becomes exciting when these members come on board and make that commitment. If I take the example of Ghana, where uh, uh, our research showed that uh, $25 million is lost because of cash transactions, uh, uh, and in addition to that, there's loss of life because these uh, big transactions uh, uh, in cash mean that uh, you know, people are, are, are risking their lives, keeping this money around them, transporting this money, and people had died as a result of uh, 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 doing doing business this way. And so the Ghana Cocoa Board, doing everything possible to digitize their value chain, digitize payments, and giving them give, making that commitment that by this time we want to uh, the entire end-to-end -end value chain to be digitized. We want payments to be all made and received uh, digitally. That kind of commitment is what fuels uh, our work. But there's also the, 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 the supply side, the fintech. Um, uh, uh, they come from such a great place and I think that uh, uh, once they complement this work, uh, they complement their work by building a foundation of trust in their systems as they design and put people at the center, uh, it will be easy for people to adopt them because what we say is digital has to offer value that is better than cash. So the more uh, cash is king, it means that those working in the ecosystem are not doing enough to build trust into digital. Uh, uh, or they are doing everything possible, it's really an expensive undertaking uh, to, to, to uh, uh, get people to move from uh, what they have only known for all their lives to something else. COVID accelerated the demand for digitization, whether it is uh, uh, payments or it is uh, uh, financial services or logistics, etc. You had uh, 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 women in the market, men in the market, scrambling to see how they can reach their customer and make a payment, uh, 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 and reach their customer to make the sale and receive the payment. So once we, uh, we no longer need to show why it is important to digitize. I think now it is to ensure that all the people who are introduced for the very first time to digital operations, digital transactions uh, are well catered for, that they are brought along the journey to where we build trust, that they don't revert back now to cash, which we are seeing in many, uh, in many countries. So the work that we're doing and that we, we, we are going to uh, uh, especially work uh, with African fintechs is to uh, get them to know these principles for responsible digitization, support them in uh, ensuring that they fully understand we have these conversations around what it means to be responsible, who needs to be responsible, what it takes, that we collectively work together to where Flota Web says that we, we have designed with these specific needs. Because of interoperability, we have achieved this much, that they are designing responsibly and also holding the regulators, uh, the government, the financial services uh, providers that, that they work with to also uphold these principles such that we can uh, build uh, trust. The more uh, uh, we, we move towards digital economies, and this is something that the African Union has committed to, and you will hear it uh, among the top priorities to recover from COVID, that they must become digital economies because fundamentally, and most importantly, it would help the continent to mobilize 
their local resource, our local resources in order to uh, fund uh, development more easily. That we can also fund fintech uh, uh, that are coming up. Uh, uh, and and funds that are in financial services, etc., that would drive the development that needs to happen uh, for the continent. So uh, at the Better Than Cash, uh, as Flutterwave is more successful, as the government of Ghana, the Cocoa Board is more successful, as businesses in every single one of those markets, whether you're selling uh, uh, princess, I think <laughs> would appreciate, we're sending boli and peanuts, uh, uh, roasted plantains, uh, on the side of the road, you too can benefit from the cash flow that you're you, you're entering into your you're, you're bringing into your business uh, by getting access to finance by having an application that helps you to manage your stock. Um, ultimately, we see digital payments as a driver for all these things, and it's important that it's done responsibly because it's the first step for many uh, to get into uh, uh, fintech solutions. And therefore, it has to be a trustworthy uh, uh, interaction. And, and that is what we mean by responsible. And so the better than cash, we will work ourselves out of the job when people are finding greater value in digital payments and therefore making that transition to cash. And I think it will take the effort of the fintechs, all the investors that are uh, looking to 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 contribute to this sector, it's such uh, a big it's a big and a big investment to build that trust, but is one that will have a multiplier effect for generations to come. Um, and I really hope that we can all make that commitment to drive response with digitization. Uh, such that in the next or did, did I lose you? I think I think we caught just at the last end that you were saying that this should be responsible and inclusive growth, and that's that. I think that's a very key point um, uh, out of what you shared from that alliance and and the work that that stands before companies like Flutterwave who benefit from from that. Um, so at this point, I'd like to invite Princess into the conversation because, um, as you were noting, companies like Flutterwave are providing that reliable financial services, um, that platform, that, that trusted um, and responsible uh, platform uh, for a large unbanked population um, by transforming payments in Africa. Um, and really in the rest of the world, as Princess was uh, outlining in various other uh, markets where Flutterwave is active and, and growing. Uh, but for the purposes of this conversation, if I might, Princess, um, could you share with us, uh, sort of sticking with that theme of partnership, um, how can African and, and international uh, fintech firms uh, really work together to promote uh, greater digitalization? Um, and to uh, support support the growing uh, e-commerce uh, uh, platforms that that are dependent on on digital payments um, across the continent, as as Lucy noted, uh, COVID nineteen has really accelerated that process. It's really sort of um, uh, been at the heart of the African Union, really uh, focusing in on uh, these efforts. Um, and so, uh, would love to learn from the case study of Flutterwave in terms of, um, the success that you all have had and, and how you see that partnership with other, uh, firms really being, um, able to, to spur that greater digitalization. Thank you. Um, so digital payments today across Africa is highly fragmented. Um, which makes it very difficult for merchants to accept payments. So what we've done at Flutterwave is we've built an infrastructure that enables all our customers and our merchants to experience a seamless end-to-end -end processing ecosystem. This means that we have replaced um, the multiple payment integrations that most merchants or customers have to do with just one payment processing API. 
We want all our customers to focus on doing business while we focus on all the heavy components, which include the payment gateway, risk management functions, and transaction processing itself. Um, in our transformation drive in Africa, we also understand that Africa does not exist in isolation of itself. Therefore, we are constantly bridging the gap in digital finance, not only in Africa, but to other parts of the world, including Europe, the US, and Asia. And just as Lucy has said, it's really important for us to build the currency of trust across the payments ecosystem because the only way we can scale, the only way we can work together to um, increase digitalization across Africa and the world is to build the currency of trust across um, with our customers and merchants. And the best way to do this would one be collaboration. Um, so um, most fintechs, financial services institutions, we need to work together. We need to, first of all, highlight and work with regulators to stipulate policies that would support complex payment supply chains, meaning that our African merchants today would have more options to connect their local e-payment systems with services used by their global customers. And just as Lucy also pointed out, interoperability is really key. We need to make the ecosystem a lot more interoperable and such that um, our customers can find easier ways to transact and, you know, um, stay afloat in business. Then um, it's also important for us to, um, I would like to reiterate that it's important for us to build trust. Trust is such a huge um, factor. If the customers do not trust what we do, if the customers do not trust the platforms we put out there, they won't use it. And also we need to move Fintechs, financial institutions need to move from a product orientation to a customer specific orientation. So providing services that are targeted at specific customers and not just rolling out products and services that um, we think are best fit. We need to conduct market analysis and best fits as well to make sure that every product, every service that we roll out is useful to the customer. Thank you for that, Princess. It looks like you got a round of applause from Lucy as well. So uh, <laughs> it sounds like Flutterwave is really a, a great model from which uh, to learn. Um, and I think we've all learned a lot from this conversation. I know that we're we're close to time, and we could ask many more questions. We had a question um, around AFCFTA. We had a question around cyber that had been uh, proposed. Um, I think the, the issue of interoperability and, and putting the customer at the center are really great um, sort of uh, themes that have come out from this, but I'd love to, to offer you all each just a, a quick close. Um, uh, we'll st stay with you, Princess, and then we'll give uh, Lucy the last word. Um, are there any other key takeaways or key thoughts that you would share with the audience in terms of um, something else that we should keep in mind at the heart of how uh, digital payments and digital finance can be an enabler. Um, Princess then Lucy. Okay, great. So um, we know that with trade comes the need to exchange value and digital payments is crucial to that exchange. So the growth of fintechs and financial institutions will in no doubt contribute towards the rapid implementation of this and make it easier to transact across borders reg regardless of payment types and currencies. So we, I just want to um, encourage everyone, fintechs, financial institutions out there to remember that without a seamless intra-African payment, businesses may not be able to trade across the continent. We need to present opportunities that include areas of payment facilitation, settlement, reconciliation, and like we have repeatedly um, mentioned, we need to put the customer at the heart of all we do. So making products that are more customer centric, making sure that we have customer service um, strategies and ensuring that we keep our customers happy. Thank you. Thank you for that, Princess. Lucy, the last word. Uh, for me, a successful AFCFTA is one, uh, and a successful continent uh, is one that will have trust, right? For us to build this single market, there has to be a trustworthy, uh, there has to be trustworthy payment systems and services. And it, 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 is, it can only happen when we all come together as a collective, as a continent to fix things nationally and also collaborate regionally and continentally 
for us to truly realize the promise of this great, great market uh, uh, in the AFCFTA. Uh, and I look forward to the flutter waves uh, uh, of, 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 of Africa and others coming together, committing to, being re to doing uh, things responsibly uh, such that uh, the user remains at the center and therefore we have uh, you know, uh, uh, a successful and thriving uh, uh, continental uh, trade area for us to stand on our feet. I look forward to the collaboration with our friends uh, uh, in the US. Uh, lots of investment of opportunities, so please come and invest in Africa. I'm sure your investments will pay off uh, and together we can really drive uh, inclusion that is powered by responsible digital payments for the continent. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Lucy, and, and thank you both. I will note this formidable executive woman powered uh, uh, panel has been a great learning experience for all of us. And we hope to see many more uh, women founders, women leaders in this space elevated um, and, and really with uh, the, the customer at the center and with uh, the future of, of spurring African trade uh, being at the heart of the work that we do. Um, so thank you both for your excellent commentary today. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Mm -hmm. I'm now pleased to turn to my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Gavera Yao, who's executive director of the U.S. Africa Business Center, um, who will talk to us a, about an exciting new program to come in 2022, and he will close out our program. Dr. Yao, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Kendra, and distinguished panelists uh, for this vibrant and uh, informative panel discussion on enabling growth uh, through Africa digital finance uh, ecosystem. Uh, let me extend our sincere gratitude uh, to Flutterwave uh, and Better Than Cash Alliance for sharing those uh, wonderful insights. Uh, my name is Gavira Yao. I'm the executive director uh, of the U.S. Africa Business Center at the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce, and then I'll also lead our trade and investment tax forces. And it is my distinct pleasure to, to announce that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, in collaboration with uh, its AmCham network uh, across Africa, and also our member uh, companies, uh, will be launching the Continental Digital Competition Series uh, for African startups uh, starting next year. Uh, you may recall uh, last year that <clears throat> the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the uh, American Business Council in Nigeria successfully uh, launched the inaugural uh, digital competition for Nigerian startup uh, with the support of uh, quite a number of companies, uh, including Zenith Bank, uh, IBM, Oracle, uh, Cisco, HP, and, and so many more, uh, where we, we see three uh, startups uh, from Nigeria that were uh, awarded. We have uh, uh, AfriLearn International, Health Boutiques, uh, Tiny uh, Health Technology, uh, were all awarded uh, for their innovation uh, in education and also in health. Uh, that the innovation that we've seen have really touched the life of Nigerians uh, during the pandemic. Uh, next year, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, of course, in partnership with its affiliate uh, AmCham Network uh, in the continent, will recognize African startups uh, that are able to showcase uh, digitally enabled innovation, innovative solutions uh, that create impact for African people uh, in uh, a variety of sectors. We're thinking of agriculture, health, fintech, education, uh, supply chain, uh, and et cetera. Uh, this uh, multifaceted uh, context uh, will recognize innovators during the series of competition uh, at sub-national, uh, sub-regional level, I would say, uh, to spotlight the unique talent and contribution of entrepreneurs uh, making, uh, that are, ma are making uh, a lot of impact uh, in their community and region where they are headquartered. So concretely, the first quarter of next year, uh, first quarter of 2022, the competition series will jumpstart with the West and Central Africa Digital Entrepreneurship Competition for African startups that are in that uh, uh, sub-region. The top performers uh, of this uh, sub-region will be awarded uh, for the regional excellence uh, and also will earn the right to compete in a continental digital entrepreneurship uh, competition uh, slated 
for December 2022. Uh, similarly, in uh, uh, the second quarter of 2022, we will also continue the competition with, uh, for the Southern and East Africa, uh, where the top performer will also be recognized uh, for their regional excellence. Uh, and also uh, they will have the, the right to compete uh, at the continental uh, competition uh, in December. Uh, next, uh, in the third quarter, we'll have the North Africa Digital uh, Entrepreneurship Competition uh, that will be launched. And the awardees uh, will also be winning the right to compete uh, with the peers across uh, the continent uh, uh, in the Africa uh, Entrepreneurship uh, Competition. So finally, in, in December 2022, about uh, the same uh, same period at this time, uh, the laureate from each of these uh, regional contexts uh, will be competing among themselves for the top three uh, slots uh, to be recognized as winner for the 2022 Africa Digital Entrepreneurship Competition for Startup on the continent. Uh, these uh, winners, of course, will receive uh, both monetary prizes, but also mentorship opportunity from leading U.S. and uh, African uh, companies, as well as uh, partner institutions operating on the continent. Uh, so I, I would like to really invite all of you to stay tuned uh, for additional information on the U.S. Uh, Chamber and also our affiliate uh, uh, in January 2022 uh, for ways uh, that uh, you can be involved uh, in this exciting celebration of African innovation, uh, ingenuity, and also impact. Uh, I, I'm really looking forward to, uh, to, to providing uh, all of you more information. So uh, in closing, uh, I believe it's, uh, it's really a perfect segue for me to bring this event to, uh, to a close. Uh, indeed, uh, we have come to the end of the 2021 uh, edition of the Africa uh, Digital Economy Summit. Uh, frankly, if you look, uh, we've ordered over 700 participants tuning in uh, in this event uh, this morning. Uh, there is clearly a lot of interest uh, and, uh, and and really I think the key question is really how to harness uh, the, the digital economy in Africa and how we can uh, be really a partner uh, to, to making uh, this all this uh, happen. Uh, so I think uh, uh, what uh, we would like to do is really to foster and to promote a strong partnership uh, among uh, all these uh, key uh, stakeholders uh, to unleash the potential of uh, the, 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 the growing youth uh, on the continent. Uh, I want to say that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and its affiliate AmCham on the continent, as well as our partners, uh, will be happy uh, to serve as a conduit uh, to show really the way uh, how to, to make this uh, happen. I would like to, to take this opportunity to express our deepest uh, uh, gratitude uh, really to our sponsor for uh, and partners uh, for this 2021 edition of the uh, Digital Economy Summit. Uh, the top sponsor, as you know, is our digital driver, uh, Google for Africa. Uh, the next, uh, our digital innovator sponsor, Flutterwave, uh, digital champion, uh, Vista Bank, uh, digital architect uh, sponsor, that, that was really uh, get contribution from Citibank. Uh, I really want to thank all the sponsors for their generous contribution uh, throughout the whole uh, process. Of course, our traditional partners uh, for this event are arm champs across the continent. Uh, I would like to uh, really take this uh, this time to to thank, uh, to sincerely thank our distinguished uh, speakers uh, throughout the whole uh, event and panelists. A special thank, of course, goes to His Excellency Aikande uh, in Chilema. Uh, President of the Republic of Zambia, uh, for the vision on how to harness the digital economy on the continent and uh, in Zambia in particular. Uh, our gratitude also goes to the U.S. Uh, Trade and U.S. Uh, Development Agency, uh, USTDA. Uh, thank you, Ambassador, uh, for, of course, the continued support uh, to Africa digital transformation through uh, digital uh, infrastructure development. Uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce is extremely excited about the announcement uh, and also the Google for uh, Africa initiative uh, re recently announced by the CEO of Google uh, and then today by the managing director of Southern Africa uh, for Google. Uh, and, and most importantly, the commitment they have made uh, to really invest uh, 1 billion 
uh, in Africa to improve connectivity, uh, to invest in startups, uh, to support skills development necessary to drive the next chapter uh, of digital growth uh, in, in Africa. I believe uh, strongly that the ongoing pandemic uh, truly underscores the importance of the digital economy and the need for countries, especially in Africa, uh, uh, to invest in critical infrastructure, uh, improve connectivity, and advance digital platform to lay the foundation for inclusive reco uh, recovery. Uh, I mean, you recall during the discussion, we spoke about the, uh, how to really bridge the gender gap, but also improving the access uh, to uh, internet in rural areas. And, and most importantly, how to increase uh, economic opportunity and create decent job for African uh, youth. So the, the US Chamber of Commerce, again, and its uh, member uh, company are very much uh, committed to supporting Africa aspiration, uh, an initiative to uh, accelerate the digital transformation, uh, be it through the African uh, uh, continental free trade area, uh, AFCATO, which uh, was uh, uh, started the, 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 the commencement of trade under preferential terms this year, or through uh, a celebration of the new pathway to spur uh, trade and investment through the next generation of AGOA uh, set to expire uh, in 2025. We uh, truly hope to see you and partner with you uh, in the next year edition of Africa Digital Economy Summit and Digital Entrepreneurship Competition uh, Series for African Startups. Uh, on this juncture, I would like to thank all of you uh, and hope to see you uh, very soon. Bye-bye, uh, a bientôt for French speaking. Obrigado for our uh, Portuguese speaking. Thank you and bye-bye.